It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. There's no one else I would trust my life with. Amen? I want to invite you to take a copy of God's Word and turn with me back to the book of Acts, picking back up in chapter 12 together this morning. If you would like to make use of one of our pew Bibles that's located right there in front of you, Acts chapter 12 begins on page 1090. Have you ever had an experience in life where suddenly it takes a turn? You're going along in a certain direction. Things are clicking and moving forward, but then suddenly things shift in a different direction. Maybe for you, you wake up feeling good and things are going smooth, but then you walk into a child's room to get them up for school and you find they have a fever. What was once your day is no longer going to be your day. Maybe for you, you think it's going to be a typical day and you walk into work only to find out at the end of the day that you have been let go. Sometimes life throws us a curve. Sometimes life shifts in such a way in which we have to pivot and respond to circumstances that are happening around us. This morning, I want to invite you to consider a moment in God's Word where the apostles are called to pivot, where they have to respond to a situation and it changes the trajectory of their lives. Let's read together in God's Word, beginning in Acts chapter 12 in verse 1. God's Word says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw this met, was met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guards by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. I guarantee you when Peter woke up upon this day, he did not have in his mind, nor was it in his thought, that he would be arrested by Herod and put in prison to stand trial for his life. I'm almost certain that when James woke up on this certain day, he did not know it would be his last to die at the hands of Herod. For Peter and James, this moment in Scripture is what we would call tragic, and we would certainly call it a crisis of great proportion. I want you to think with me about this moment in Scripture and really how Peter responds to his life shifting in an entirely different direction. The Herodian dynasty had caused the church and really the Jews in particular great trouble for many generations. It was Herod the Great who is in fact ordered the death of all young children when Jesus was born. It was Herod the Tetrarch who had had John the Baptist arrested and beheaded. And now it is Herod, Herod Antipas, if you will, who is in fact continuing to cause trouble in the life of the early church. James, the son of Zebedee, or the brother of John, is arrested and dies by the sword. If Stephen was the first martyr in the church, it is James who is the first among the apostles who will die for the faith. And in verse 3 it says, Because this pleased the Jews, Herod also sought to arrest and try Peter. Make no mistake, Peter is arrested with the intention of dying at the end of the Passover celebration. Herod had one goal in mind, and that was to please the Roman officials. And one of the ways that Herod pleased Rome was by maintaining the peace with the Jews. And so whatever it was that would please the Jews, Herod would follow. And in this case, we see that it pleased the Jews to persecute the Christians. 
Peter is arrested. Peter is awaiting trial. Peter is awaiting his execution. This is a crisis. This is a challenge. This is, at the very least, to say a difficult situation at which Peter is not at fault, but rather we find that Peter is a victim of circumstance. You and I, unfortunately, are going to find moments in our life when we too are in such situations. When life pivots in a direction that we did not intend, one that we did not cause, or even one that we were not prepared for. Yet in this moment of Scripture, Peter begins to show us some incredible ways in which we can respond when life pivots. I want you to consider just a few things with me in God's Word, thinking about how we respond when crisis comes, how we respond when challenges come our way that were quite unexpected. First and foremost, what I want you to see in the beginning of Acts chapter 12 is that when challenges come our way, we have to respect the mystery of God. Things are going to happen in our lives that are going to be unexplainable as far as we are concerned. There are going to be moments in our lives where we are going to have to respect the mystery of God. Consider just these first four verses in Acts chapter 12. Herod, this ungodly man, is in a position of great power and he is using his power for the persecution of God's people. James, who has been a faithful follower of Christ, who is numbered among the apostles, dies at the hand of Herod. Peter, who has been instrumental in leading the church and helping the church find its establishment here in the book of Acts, finds himself arrested and awaiting trial for his life. This is a moment in Scripture when we look at the first four verses when we are tempted to begin to ask, God, have you lost control? This is a moment when we might be tempted to look at what's happening in the life of the early church and really begin to question and challenge God. God, why are you letting Herod rule? God, why did you let James die? God, why is Peter standing trial and facing a trial for his life? God, have you lost control? There are moments in our life where we are going to have to step back and respect the mystery of God. There are moments that we are going to encounter when things simply don't make sense. You might think of it this way. Have you ever watched an artist paint a picture the other day, there was an artist at the intersection of King Street and Janney's Lane. And uh, the, as I approached the intersection, the, the light turned yellow, and I didn't rush through it, but I stopped at the light. And right across from the light, there was an artist, a female, who had set up her easel, and she had brought her art supplies, and she was painting a landscape picture of the scene at this intersection. If you're familiar with the topography at this intersection, you know that the ground dips down in a valley. And there's a white picket fence that runs along three sides with homes running on either side of this valley. And there's beautiful trees and a glimpse of the horizon. This artist was painting a beautiful landscape picture of this scene. But as I am watching her depict that which is before her, she took what looked like a putty knife and picked up a large glob of a very dark color. And without much effort, she tilted it back and flung it on the canvas. And as I am watching her paint this portrait, I think to myself, I don't understand art at all. I certainly don't understand the process of painting a masterpiece. But as I'm waiting for the light to change, the artist takes this glob of paint that I consider a mistake, and she begins to spread it out with a brush. 
And she begins to layer one color on top of another. And before the light could turn green, this large tree emerged on the horizon. What looked like a mistake, what looked like an error to me, suddenly emerged into this beautiful masterpiece. What I thought was going to be the end of the painting, in fact, ended up being the centerpiece of the picture. Sometimes we are going to walk along in life and it's going to feel like God takes a glob of paint and throws it center stage in your life. Sometimes there's going to be a moment when you begin to wonder, God, what are you doing? But as you go along, the master takes his brush and begins to even out the rough edges and layer on the paint, and a masterpiece emerges. We have to learn in life to respect the mystery of God. There is much in this life that is mysterious. There is much that is good, and there is some that is bad. But in the crucible of God's wisdom, He has a way of mixing all these things together, not only for our good, but ultimately unto God's glory. And when life takes us in a different direction, we have to learn to step back and trust that God is good. Trust that there is an opportunity for God's redemption and God's glory to come about in our lives through something that we, quite frankly, can't yet make sense of. This is a moment in Scripture in which Peter is trusting and respecting the mystery of God. But continue reading in our passage of Scripture in verse 5. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and centuries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up! He said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. When life throws us a curve and begins to take us in a new direction, we have to learn to respect the mystery of God. But secondly, we have to learn to request the ministry of God's people. When life takes us in a new direction, we need to learn to request the ministry of God's people. Look back at verse 5. So, while Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. While Peter was in prison, the church was earnestly praying for him. Him. The ministry of God's people that is quite effective in our lives is when the people of God will pray for us. Peter is in a dire situation. He is arrested and he is awaiting his trial. He is chained to two guards with four sets of different soldiers rotating, keeping watch over him by day and by night. Peter is what I would call where I come from in a pickle. And in fact, we will find ourselves in situations where we can't see a path forward. But while Peter was in prison, the church was praying. 
And when the church is praying, things change. When your life pivots, you need to learn to request the ministry of God's people. You need to learn to ask the church to be in prayer for you. We are a church who will pray for you. We have a pastoral team who will pray for you. Notice in verse 5, it says that while he's in prison, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That word earnestly is the same word that is used to describe muscle strain. That is, the church is putting effort into this. They are not just saying, oh, bless your heart, we'll pray for you. No, this is a church that is working hard at being disciplined and putting effort in praying for Peter. It's the same word that was used to describe Jesus in Luke chapter 22 when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he is fervently praying before the Lord and it says that he was in anguish to the point that drops of blood began to sweat from his brow he was praying earnestly with great effort and with great strain while Peter is in prison the church is earnestly praying they are united in their prayer they are putting in great effort in their prayer and they are being consistent in their prayers in verse 5 while he's in prison they're praying and then look in verse 12 after Peter has been released and he goes to the home of his friends Notice what the people of God are doing. It says in verse 12, When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. The people of God are praying for Peter. And friends, let me encourage you that we as a church are a church who will pray for you. If your life has taken a turn that you did not expect, we are a church who will pray for you. You have a pastor who will pray for you. And in fact, we will earnestly pray for you. We will continue to bend a knee before Almighty God to come alongside you in ministry and lift you up in prayer. Brother Don told you a minute ago, there's a connection card there in your pew back in front of you. There's an option on that connection card to say, I want to be contacted for prayer. If that's you this morning, you can select that box and someone will reach out to you. We will pray with you. You can write your prayer request on the back of that card and place it in the offering plate. We will pray for you. When life pivots... We have to respect the mystery of God. We have to request the ministry of God's people. And certainly, last but not least, we have to rest in the peace of God. Notice what Peter is doing amidst all of this. Look back in verse 5. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping. The night before Herod was to bring him on trial, Peter was sleeping. I love this picture of Peter because it's not as if somehow he's just exhausted and fell asleep under his exhaustion. No, Peter is sleeping and he's sleeping quite soundly. He's taken his sandals off and placed them at the foot of the bed. He's gone to the effort to take off his outer garments and he's sleeping in his undergarments on the bed while chained to two prisoners. And he's sleeping so soundly that when the angel enters into the prison cell and the light begins to shine around him it's not until the angel in verse 7 reaches down and touches his side that he actually awakes from his sleep while he is awaiting trial Peter is sleeping what do you suppose it was about Peter that gave him the ability to sleep maybe perhaps it was past experience Earlier in the book of Acts, you might recall, Peter's been in this situation before. He's been arrested and been in prison and the Lord delivered him. So in fact, he may be sleeping soundly because he knows if God did it once, then God can do it again. And you know what? For you and I, we would do well to remember the ways that God has worked in the past. Because if God has worked that way in the past, then he can do it again in our lives. And we should anticipate and pray for him to do so. 
But you know what? I reckon that the reason Peter is able to sleep so soundly on the night before his trial is because he knows Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. The reason that Peter is able to sleep so soundly is because he's seen the resurrected Lord. And he knows whether he lives and is delivered from this prison, he will go on for the glory of God. But even if he doesn't, his life is so secured by faith in Christ Jesus that he will still dwell in the glory of God. Friends, let me ask you a question. If you knew that tomorrow was your day of execution, would you sleep soundly tonight? Are you so aware of the promises of God and His Word and your faith in Christ Jesus that even if you knew tomorrow was the end, would you be able to sleep soundly? Peter is resting in the peace of God. Peter is so confident in what Christ has been able to accomplish him that he can get a good night's sleep. Do you struggle sleeping at night? Are you so confident in God and what He has done for you that you can rest? Would you do me a favor? Later today, would you finish reading chapter 12? The story is incredible. And if you continue to read on in chapter 12, you know that the story ends well for Peter. Peter walks out of the prison. He goes to the home of his friends. And in this great power of God, he delivers him from this prison. And Peter will go on to do great ministry. And Herod will get justice. Herod will die by the end of the chapter. And it will say that his body is eaten by the worms. Just keep reading. Finish the chapter. If you don't have a Bible, just take that pew Bible home. It's our gift to you today. And finish reading what God's Word has. But if you're here today and you don't have the peace of God, you can receive it today by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because the truth is, when we look at this story together, it's not a matter of how the story ends that gives Peter peace. It's a matter of whether or not he has faith in Jesus Christ. See, for all of us, the circumstances of our life do not dictate the end of our story, but rather the end of our story was determined when Jesus Christ died upon the cross. Whether Peter or not, Whether Peter lives or not is irrelevant, but what matters is that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of his sins, and even if he is not delivered, he will still dwell in the glory of God. Do you remember how this story started? Go back and look at verse 2. Herod had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. If we were to take a moment and compare James's experience with Peter's experience, we would say that James lost out. But the truth is, James was just as delivered as Peter was delivered. Both of them know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And although their deliverance was different, the end of their story is the same. They dwell in the presence of God forever. God may perform a miracle in your life and He may deliver you like Peter. But even if He doesn't, your future has never been secured by your circumstances, but it has always been secured in Jesus' death upon the cross. And when Jesus willingly laid His life down upon the cross, and when He willingly gave up His last breath while dying, He gave you the victory that you needed. 